If you're looking for Mickey, it turns out he is absolutely everywhere. And if he's attached to your last name, then you just can't lose him. If you can't live on $999 million, you've got so many bigger problems. Honestly, if you really stop to consider what a billion dollars is, it is just a, a sickening amount of money. So I really believe that if you could turn one company, especially a company like Disney, you could really make visible what's possible. Coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. We're starting another year with inequality gaping. Over the last decade, the median net worth of the top 10 billionaires in the world has nearly tripled. In fact, all but two of the top 10 are centi-billionaires. It's inconceivable to most Americans who are for the first time earning less than their parents. Economic mobility is on the decline, but that doesn't stop the entertainment industry, which continues to serve up American dream rags to riches stories. And no company does that more energetically than Disney. When the granddaughter of one of the founders of that company received an invitation from a Disney employee to look into the quality of life for workers at Disney's flagship theme park, Disneyland, Abigail Disney found that some cast members, as they're called, were earning one two thousandth of the earnings of CEO Bob Iger. Working full time, they were barely getting by. She thought that was wrong. She wrote to Iger. She testified in Congress. And ultimately, she did what she does. She made a film. The result is a very personal documentary, The American Dream and Other Fairy Tales, which calls out inequality and the policies and values that create it, not just at Disney, but across the business world. Abby Disney is an Emmy Award winning documentary filmmaker, an activist with the patriotic millionaires and the granddaughter of Roy Disney, who co-founded the company with Walt. The film, co-directed with Kathleen Hughes, is available for streaming now. And I am so happy to welcome Abigail Disney to our screens. It must be quite something to be a Disney in this world. The only word for it is weird. If you're looking for Mickey, it turns out he is absolutely everywhere. And, and if he's attached to your last name, then you just can't lose him. Have you always had a sense of kind of corporate responsibility or responsibility around the name? Um, yes, I always have had a sense. I think, you know, when, when, when we were very young, we used to go, you know, to the park, as we called it by with my grandfather or with my parents. And usually there was an occasion that we were going there for like the a parade was starting or, or the small world ride was opening. That's one of my best memories. And so we would be dressed to the nines and, uh, we would be on our very best behavior. And, um, and so I think the place we, we were always aware that we had a special relationship to this place and that everybody else really loved it. And, um, and then, you know, as I got older, I got interested in other people's responsibilities and corp other corporations and other things going on. It kind of left some space between myself and the company in terms of my um, activism and my thinking about social justice. But I kind of couldn't stay away from it forever because it was just this gaping, you know, problem in the center of everything. In 2018 is really when things took a shift. What happened? There had been a series of stories, um, as there very often are, about workers at Disneyland not being well treated, but it had really um, started to pop up much more often. And so I had allowed myself to kind of not really look um, at the problem for a long time. Um, I figured, you know, that wasn't my job. <laughs> I would do other things. But uh, then I got this very direct message from a, a worker at Disneyland on Facebook. And I actually never look at Facebook messages. I have no idea why I looked at this message. But once I'd read it, you know, it kind of felt like I couldn't unread it. And I couldn't unbe in relationship suddenly with this individual person. And when it became personal, then I just felt like I needed to follow what my um, sense of responsibility was telling me to do, which was to go out there and, and talk to people. Well, to give you a taste, here's the trailer from the film The American Dream and Other Fairy Tales, co-directed by my guest, Abigail Disney, with Kathleen Hughes. Disneyland was not like anywhere else on Earth. When I started working at the park, the employees were so happy to be there. The 
the company appreciated you. At least it did. Having the last name Disney is like having a weird superpower you didn't ask for. But then one day, I got a message from a guy named Ralph who worked at Disneyland. How many of you know somebody who works at Disney who slept in their car in the last oh. couple of years? How many of you know somebody who have gone without medical care oh. because they can't afford it? <laughs> the American dream teaches us that if you work hard enough, anything is possible. It's magical thinking. Dr. Disney. Disney could raise the salaries of all of its workers to a living wage. It was possible to do this when my great uncle and grandfather built the company. It's possible now. That is socialism. There we go. We socialism. know what that is. We're the people who do the pixie dust tonight. You scrub the kitchens, the floor, the toilets. With both of us working full time, we still fall below poverty level. A custodian would have to work for 2,000 years to make what Bob Iger makes in one. The Disney company is ground zero of the widening inequality in America. Well, what was so striking, and you see it in the film, is the love so many of those employees have or had or kind of want to have um, to the whole Disney brand and their experience. That part of it was super moving, I thought. I think it's really moving and it's one of my favorite things about the company, although it's also, it's deeply painful to talk about, to be honest, because I also know that that's one of the reasons that the company gets away with paying people so poorly, that they kind of use that as a way of keep stringing people on and, and, and promising people better things later if they will only try hard enough. You found that many of the workers, including the guy who wrote to you, Ralph, were barely getting by. So you go off on an investigation as to how did things get to be this way? And would I be right in saying that you began with a sense that it wasn't like that in your grandfather's time? My grandfather definitely had his flaws but he was a decent person. And uh, he really, really, really cared about individual people. He cared, I think this is where I got it from. He cared about the person he was interacting with, not the position that person held. And so he didn't really value, you know, the CEO any more highly than he valued somebody who was sweeping the sidewalk. And, and that was a value that he instilled in people who worked for the company. That was why he always picked up garbage when, when he was in the park. He um, felt really strongly that, that running a company was about taking care of the people around you. You know, that's rank paternalism. I recognize that. Um, but it's better than the soulless uh, kind of treating people like cogs in a machine that we have now. What did you find that change to have been caused by? There was a conscious movement afoot in the 70s and 80s among a certain kind of corporate interest, um, namely the, the managements and the boards and the kind of the ruling class of, of corporate America. They wanted to change the way we understood corporations and their role in public life and where individuals fit into the picture around corporations. And they were people who genuinely believed America, America's mo best and most important interest was their corporate um, community. They wanted to change America into a place where people put the corporation ahead of themselves, people put themselves ahead of others. There are still a handful of companies that operate in the way that my grandfather operated Disney, um, but they are in the minority. And what happens is even when they last and even when they survive in the context of this incredibly cutthroat environment, they'll get bought up by a private equity company eventually or exited by their owners in some way. The Heather McGee, the economist who we've had on our program, talks about the role that race played in all of this and what it was that shifted things when we went from a period perhaps in the 30s where government was expanding opportunity for the white working class to a period where government was actually trying to enforce civil rights laws and maybe shift the status quo a bit to become more inclusive of women and people of color and immigrants. Race is the American Achilles heel. It has always been the Achilles heel. And one of the things that Heather talks about in that book that is so important is that we were all vulnerable 
this hearty, healthy economy that, that my grandfather thrived in, which had a more collective spirit and which was more fair-minded about how it treated people, also had this fatal characteristic, which was that it tolerated the oppression and suppression of large swaths of the American public. It, it abided a level of cruelty and heartlessness. And so when the cruelty and the heartlessness started to grow like a virus inside of the body politic, um, there was no stopping it because there was always such a high tolerance for cruelty. So what she says in the film that's really important is what's happening for white Americans isn't new. They are living the reality that black and brown Americans have lived all along. And if we had cared about their well-being, um, we, we might have been better equipped to fight this challenge that came from above. The point is so important that it wasn't just that the generation of your grandfather and his brother was kindly gentler. It was also the fact that government was keeping people in check, along with unions. And yes. um, the unions played a huge role in all of this, as they are playing today. Yes. But the power of unions has shrunk tremendously. So we have something like 6% of private employ private industry workers unionized, um, mm -hmm. way down from where it was even when you and I were born. Talk about how that then enabled these corporations to get government off their backs when it comes to everything you're talking about. The ass assault on the union movement was a very thoughtful, um, strategic move. And if you remember Ronald Reagan's election, he ran in support of the air traffic controllers, actually. He made public statements during his campaign supporting the air traffic controllers, but in February after his inauguration, so less than a month after he was inaugurated, he did one of the most famous things he did, which was to fire the entire union. And he didn't just fire the entire union. He made it so that nobody in that union could ever hold a government job again. Um, so he didn't just crush that union, he destroyed everyone in it. And it was important that he do it that way. And there, there are letters, if you read, um, I think it's Kim Fine's book, um, The Invisible Hands, um, she quotes a CEO in a letter saying, oh, we all knew that was a message. We all knew what Ronald Reagan was trying to communicate to us when he did that. It was a green light to go after unions and that government wouldn't be representing their interests anymore. And it destroyed the collective spirit. It destroyed the idea that when you show up for work, you show up work for work shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of other people who are your peers, who, who have a shared interest with you, and that therefore collective bargaining was the best way for you to represent your own interests in the workplace. So it splintered everyone. And absent collective bargaining, we are all subject to the tender mercies of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Collective bargaining is the only way workers have to, to uh, democratically uh, represent their own interests in the workplace. Isn't what we're talking about just capitalism, the great unspoken word? No, no, actually. And even if you, if you resurrected Adam Smith today, he would look at what we have and say, my goodness, what have you done? <laughs> it, it's, the, it's the difference between a religion and the fundamentalist version of that religion. And the fundamentalist version of anything is a clinging to a handful of tenets and precepts at the expense of the spirit um, of the thing that you are that you're supporting. And so we we live under a regime of fundamentalist masculinity, frankly. We live under a regime of fundamentalist capitalism. And even Milton Friedman, the, the patron saint of this form of capitalism, himself said, within reason, um, within the confines of public mores and values. And so we, we just kind of raced to the other side of the pendulum. Um, and not that what we had before was, you know, all the way out at nine o'clock, you know, but we're over here at three. And, um, and, and what is holding it here is, a, you know, a now very moneyed class. And now that Citizens United, you know, such an investment in, in taking off all the guardrails on how money could play a role in politics has caused all this money and these moneyed interests to flood into the space to now protect their already substantial advantages. 
So the question is, what do we do about it? I mean, you and I may disagree about how capitalism functions. I, I read most of that Thomas Piketty book, and it seemed to suggest that this is inevitable, that with incremental growth, or rather really exponential growth, um, you are going to get these huge disparities between rich and poor. We're there now with this huge portion of all global wealth in the hands of basically a handful of people. Yeah. Is it shiftable? I mean, what can we do? I think that the first thing that has to happen is we have to find a way to get money out of politics. And I, that sounds like an impossible task, except that we still have the somewhat of a democracy in place. Um, we still find politicians like Bernie Sanders succeeding by raising money from lots and lots of individuals who give a little instead of a handful of individuals who give a lot. And as long as we still have the shreds of that democracy, we still have a hope of, for instance, passing laws to protect us from the Citizens United decision and constraining money in politics. Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision that took all limits off campaign financing in the name of corporate free speech. Thomas Piketty is right. You know, what he says is, if you predicate your central social enterprise around the idea that there must be year over year growth ad infinitum, then you are eventually going to reach a limit and that can't be sustained. Um, but but the, the growth rate that we've been insisting on over the last 30 years or so has been in the six and seven and 12 and 14 percent. Um, and that's a, a, a highway to hell for everybody, ultimately. But a two percent growth rate, you know, uh, can be accommodated over the long term if you have a healthy, vigorous government pushing back over time on the excesses and on the ways in which that growth rate is eating into our basic fundamental resources and rights. I remember talking to venture capitalist Nick Hanauer, who I think you know also, who um, said soon after the financial crash that he thought, you know, the rich should watch out, that there were going to be people coming with pitchforks. I haven't seen those pitchforks, but I have seen a few more labor strikes than ever, a huge spike in labor activity in 2022. Where do you see signs of hope? Well, first of all, there have been pitchforks and they were there on January 6th, right? So I guess those were, weren't the ones I was thinking of. Yes, they, but they were pitchforks with um, an analysis that had misdirected their energies. But what they have fundamentally over there on the far right wing is an anti-corporate analysis. And when Ron DeSantis pushed back on Disney and talked about what, when you hear about woke capitalism, that is the sound of their anti-corporate ethos, because they know they can't hold people forever unless they speak up about what is so plainly happening to their own people, right? So, so they have used and misdirected the anti-corporate impulse that is a fundamental populist impulse, right? To and, and set us against each other and set us against the government in all sorts of ways. And on top of it, they armed us up um, and they and they highly destabilized every nook and cranny of American culture right now. So, so it was never gonna be as straightforward as a bunch of pitchforks in front of the castle. The real problem, the persistent problem is wealth inequality. And, and that starts with, for instance, the way wealth is taxed. I own, that's what I do for money is own. I sit on my couch owning things. And you know, people show up for work every day and pay a higher effective tax rate on the money that comes into them because they work than I pay on the money that comes to me because I sit on my couch and own. So, so that's a very fundamental um, failure of applying our moral systems and our basic shared values to the tax code. And a tax code is an expression of norms and values. It's nothing else but that. So we really need to elect people who will fight to help empower the IRS to actually collect the taxes um, that are owed them, first of all, because you're more likely to be audited if you're low income than if you have a lot of money. So let's start auditing some of the people who are making a game out of evading taxes. Let's change the code so it, it tax work at a more favorable rate than ownership. And, and let's think about a, a wealth tax. I think the wealth tax is the only way we're actually gonna make a difference. And then a high, high, high um, income tax at the top bracket. Uh, like uh, one that discourages you from wanting to make $2 million a year. 
because nobody needs $2 million a year. So a, a punitive top end. My grandfather became a very wealthy man paying upwards of 70 to 75% on his income. Bernie Sanders said that he ran on, well, among other things, there should be no billionaires. I agree. Because uh, honestly, if you can't live on $999 million, you've got so many bigger <laughs> problems than just that last million dollars. Honestly, if you really stop con to consider what a billion dollars is, it is just a, a sickening amount of money. Were you ever inclined, as I watched your interviewing these folks, did it ever feel to you that you should just give them your money? <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. I feel that every day. And I've felt that every day since I was very young. Um, and I have struggled with that for a long time. As I got deeper and deeper into my activism, my philanthropy, and my thinking about this, it came to me that, you know, what I have is a drop in the bucket as compared to what needs to happen. And I could help a lot of individual people over the short term or even over their lifetimes, I could do that. Um, but I, but I wouldn't change anything. And, and so there would just be other people who would flood into the space that they had vacated by rising on the ladder. And I'm worried about the, 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 the spot at the bottom of the ladder, which is, which is filled with people who will never have a chance to rise. Like I, if I don't use my resources to change the, the circumstances, the values, um, and the structures that led me to have these kinds of advantages, then, I, then I've wasted it. Well, let's check out some of the trailer. This isn't just a Disney story. It's the story of nearly half of American workers who can't make ends meet. I have this passion growing within me now, building power for working class people like me. If you could tell Disney anything, what would you tell them? We'd like to be able to have a home. If you call Amer the American dream, the idea that you can rise from rags to riches, that there's mobility in our economy, um, a fantasy tale, as you do in the top of the film, I don't know whether you go so far as to say the dream is dead, but it does leave me wondering what would be a dream worthy of this century, worthy of the 21st century, knowing all that we know about what, as you mentioned, this endless pursuit of individual wealth and um, growth has where it's brought us. We used to share a dream about shared accomplishment, shared success, shared well-being. That dream has always been there under the surface. We need to empower the people who believe in that dream. We need to bring them into leadership and we, we need to readjust the American mind, which has been kind of poisoned with fantasies about rising. If Disney were to say our value is not just the profits that come to our shareholders, um, but but how our our people are treated, our effect on the environment, our effect on the American imagination, and they they in some ways do that very well. That last part, um, th there are so many companies that would follow them. I really believe that if you could turn one company, um, especially a company like Disney, you could really make visible what's possible. Abby Disney, thank you so much for your work for your film. You also host a podcast. I encourage people to check it out. All ears with Abigail Disney. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. Great to talk to you too. Family, tradition, history, custom. It's all very hard to go up against. And a whole lot of people have been punished for doing exactly that. I think anxieties about losing traditions are behind a lot of people's anxieties these days about change. But at the same time, a whole lot of change making is happening precisely because people have started grappling with the histories that led them to this point. A friend of mine, for example, recently inherited some land from a racist grandfather, which she decided to give back to the Native American nation from which it had been stolen centuries back. In so doing, did she run up against some disregard, some resentment, anger in her family? Sure. But she also enriched her own life enormously through the new relationships she's gained as a result. Abby Disney looked at her family history and took what she liked to use against what she didn't, lifted up a part of her family history to challenge the present. And maybe we can all do that. Look 
closely enough, and there are probably parts of your family history that do represent the values you want to enliven today. I know those exist in my life. There are bits I like, bits I don't like. So how about we thought of biography less as Bible and more as buffet? Take what you like, leave the rest, feel good about the most of it. I'm Laura Flanders. There's much more to be said, and you can hear my full conversation with Abby Disney through a subscription to our free podcast, which I urge you to check out. You can get all the information at our website. Till the next time, stay kind, stay curious. I'm Laura, and thanks for joining us. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org.